didn't know each other when we began. We only knew we were fed up. Too much hatred and bigotry against anyone who was different. But how to fight it? Hope After Hate is a project to empower people to stand up to discrimination wherever they find it. I'm tired of looking on the news and on social media and seeing all this terrible hatred and bigotry that's happening today. Does it even matter what kind of discrimination? Could be bullying, could be racism, could be anti-Semitism. What we're seeing now sounds a lot like what happened leading up to World War II. And that led to the murder of more than six million Jews and millions of other minorities based on religion, race, and sexual preference. So we headed to Poland and Germany to follow the story of one young boy who survived the Holocaust. His name was Moniek, and he was our professor's dad. Hope After Hate is a multimedia project that was founded by our professor, Hagit Lamour. Her father is a Holocaust survivor. His memories are starting to fade, so Hagit created this project to encapsulate his memory and his legacy. Like the more we learned about in the class and the history and the more Hagit showed us like real world examples of how it's all happening again, the more I, you know, started to like get invested. I became even more passionate about the project. For some of us, this was personal. The project felt really important to me and kind of hit an emotional part because um, I deal with like racial discrimination. When you know, I heard about fighting uh, hatred and bigotry. It just took me back to middle school when, you know, kids would call me names because they knew that my dad was from Pakistan. I, I knew I definitely have a passion for wanting to do what I can to make the world a better place. Hope After Hate tries to allow people to figure out what they can do, what they can do to make a better, more just society. And once we started to see what it took to survive back then, and to do it, with hope for the future. We started to see how we could spread that message today. And it was about stopping hatred and bigotry. And you know, it's a really emotional story and I think it's one that needs to be told. And then it turned into, holy crap, this project is ginormous and like it has such a big effect that I had no idea. I just have so much more appreciation for the survivors, for the people who never gave up hope. And I wanted to be a part of a project that can change the next generation and to tell people that if we don't stop, history is just going to repeat itself and I don't, I don't want that to happen. I didn't fully comprehend the power of the message and the power of what this project could bring. We left in October for Germany and Poland. So we left Cincinnati, flew to Chicago, then from Chicago we flew to London, and from London we flew to Warsaw. A very safe and pleasant on the We are flying with lots of gear to shoot two projects. A 15-minute virtual reality experience. People will be able to put on goggles and be in the places where my father's Holocaust journey took place. And we wanted to show the audience what the spaces actually look like and we are creating video for an audience immersive play. There will be screens all around the audience and we will be using projections that we shot in both 360 virtual reality, drone, and video. Our first night in Warsaw, we had a group dinner at a Polish restaurant. And then uh, we rested up for the next day to come. The Warsaw Ghetto was the largest ghetto in, um, in Poland, next to Lodz and then Lvov. So then the next day, I believe, was the tour of Warsaw. We looked at some of the remains of the ghetto that was in Warsaw. There were over 300,000 Jews who lived in Warsaw, and uh, the majority of them perished. It's just casual that people live here, and like a, the wall to the ghetto, like a huge piece of history is just right outside their window. And I felt like I was third grade Madison. I was eight years old reading uh, 
any snippet of Anne Frank for the first time. Um, the stones that you see in the wall here, those little stones were put there probably by visitors. Um, as a memorial in the Jewish tradition, we do leave stones on gravestones, on tombstones, and so- We visited the, uh, the walls of the ghetto in Warsaw, Poland today, uh, and just going up to it and touching it, it was really emotional. From Warsaw, we took a bus to Czestochowa, the city where our professor's father grew up, a peaceful life until the Nazis invaded. We started out visiting its most famous site, Jasna Gora, where the painting The Black Madonna has attracted millions of people since the 1400s. Then we settled in for what we would do every night, what we called nightly confessionals. The main thing that we just did was set up the cameras and then kind of let people talk. There were some moments where people wanted to be kind of like left alone, so we would just set up the camera, press play, put a mic on them, and then just let them talk and then come back and turn the cameras off. The most interesting part was definitely the Warsaw Ghetto. It was really interesting to see something like that that I've only seen in movies or read in texts, but now it's right in front of me in real life. I am feeling exhilarated. I am excited to see what comes, uh, heavy or not. I'm feeling pretty good right now. I'm looking forward to getting into the weeds here in Chinstehova and exploring Monyek's childhood home and where he was at until he got captured. You know, I think it's a really powerful project and it's going to be heavy. Um, and it's going to be emotional, but I'm looking forward to it, I'm excited, and I think what we're going to put together is going to be great. Imagine right now, Monyak and the group of people all marching down this road and about to enter to the right will be the gate into Hasad. Once they entered here, they could not leave and they were in here for about a year and a half. Monyek was forced to make bullets for the Nazi army. They were forced to live there. They hardly got any food. They couldn't leave. There were armed guards and barbed wire and guns pointed at them. I don't really know a better definition of enslavement. This was their life. Monyek was there, I think, about a year and a half and he had several different jobs, um, but the one he liked the most was uh, he had to take care of the camp's ducks. And so he would lead them to a little pond that was, uh, I don't know, maybe a couple hundred meters from the, the main building. It was just so, so beautiful, and it represented hope and peace for him. You know, instead of experiencing life as a 12-year-old boy, you know, he's working in a work camp, and his big event is not, you know, going to get ice cream or something, it's watching ducks. Nazis took as many people as they could out of here to Germany as they were retreating. This is where he was shoved onto that train that led out of here and ended up at Buchenwald, where we're going to go in about five days. You'll see, this is where he got on the train and you'll see where he got off the train at the concentration camp in Germany. It was very surreal to be able to stand there where an event like that happened and be able to to sort of see it for what it was. And I just thought that that was, it was just so strange to me that people were just casually going about themselves. I know Ed and I at one point, we walked into this room to take some pictures and video and it was strangely beautiful because the roof had all caved in. There was just basic support beams up top and then on the floor was just a mound of rubble and there was a tree growing in it and just seeing the sun come in through the windows onto that I think it kind of showed what hope after hate is about is that you can have this mess but also this beautiful life coming out of it. On that uh, transport the day before the camp was liberated so here is the actual memorial that I talked to you about before we even got here. Um, now that you can see it up close, you get a different sense of what is actually here. The, uh, the place that affected me the most was the, uh, the monument to Chinstohova Jews uh, 
It's the one where it was, it's at the railway, well, the former railway station. This is where they were gathered um, to be sent off to their deaths. So. It was in September of 1942. Uh, they shipped 40,000 people from Częstochowa to Treblinka in a matter of like three days. And Treblinka was not like Auschwitz and other uh, concentration camps. It was a death camp, so its sole purpose was to gas and murder. Um, as many people as possible. Including Monique's mom and his brother. Now today, there's a memorial there. It's a big brick wall, and there's a split in that wall. On the left side of that wall is a Star of David made out of train rails. On the other side is train tracks. And if you look through the split in the wall, you see a weeping willow. Then not knowing where they're going, not knowing what's going to happen, being separated from your family. I don't know if you can recapture it, but I think of it for my kids. I have two kids, 13 and 10. I think of them just like right now, if someone just took them away from me and they were just put over on a train on their own, 13 and 10, not knowing what was going to happen. Put yourself in that spot, even if like right now someone just grabbed you and put you on a train, you don't know where it's going. If you were going to Treblinka, you were going to die. 40,000 people. If you think of that number, it's, it's tremendous. Basically what they did is they would take the adults and they would start packing these trains full of adults. And once they couldn't pack any more of them in, they would start shoving teens and kids up on top of them. And uh, for... You know, I'm, I'm a father and a grandfather, so when I heard that, it just tore me up and I, I lost it. I, you know, I cried like a baby. Imagine if the entire campus of the university emptied in the matter of days. That's how many people disappeared, went to their deaths. This was his block. This was the place where he had an amazing, happy childhood. He loved his hometown. My grandfather was a self-made man, an inventor, an artist. He was a businessman too, very savvy. And so through time, he built a factory. They were able to buy this immense space in Częstochowa in a new part of the city, right in the downtown area. It was a beautiful, beautiful flat and it was huge. On one side, they had the factory, and on the other side, they had their living quarters. My father grew up such a happy little boy until one day when the Nazis rolled in. My father was eight years old when his entire life was upended. We went up there, and it was, it was so hard to believe that, you know, the when Nazis came through, and there's so much hate in that household for how warm and loving it felt when we went to go visit. I found myself on the balcony, uh, just looking over, over the, the city, and uh, I just thought it was so peaceful. I thought about how terrible it was to take that away from somebody. But then when you think about it and you look into the history, you're looking out on what was a selection square, where Jewish people were chosen whether they would live or die or get sent to a concentration camp. After the invasion, they would just be able to hide in the balcony, but then when things got worse, they built a false wall in the attic, and they would hide in the attic either for a couple hours or for days. We didn't even think we would be able to go up, but we were able to go up to the attic as well and kind of see where he was hiding out at in the beginning. Hagi thought there was almost no way, but the lady who lives there now um, at the last second just sort of allowed us to go up in pairs of two. You had to sit there and take it in for those 10 seconds because it was crazy to try to imagine what took place there. This was the most, uh, this was the most emotional experience I've had uh, to date on this project. We might see a lot of like horrible things such as the railroads, the small ghettos, the, the bars, the wires, but at the same time we're also seeing 
the places of freedom, like the duck pond. Hagit told us the story about how when the Nazis would come upstairs, the occupants of the house would run to the other end of the house where there was a window that they could climb into another apartment, which was uh, some relatives of theirs. And so this worked for a while to keep them out of being captured by the Nazis. Standing there, just like thinking about that was really just, it was horrible to think that that happened. And that wasn't even a century ago. Oh, how nice. The next day, we boarded the bus to a place that would prove to be just as emotional. The Jewish cemetery of Chanstehova used to be an amazing, well-kept up place where every Jew in Chanstehova was buried. When we walk in here, you're going to not believe the condition of the cemetery. It's in horrible shape. All the vegetation that you'll see is because nobody took care of it after the 1940s. This was a cemetery owned by the Jews. The Jews disappeared. Nobody else came to take care of it. It was all overgrown. Uh, it, it hurt a little bit to see that people didn't care and just let this happen to the graves. Some of these date back to the 1800s. Some are in the 1900s. Families were buried here. Generations were buried here. Um, so all the history there is just kind of gone. You know, the people whose families there, they're gone. Here's one. Yep, yep, yep. Here's one grave you see where the bullet hole is. When the war began, it became a place, not only of the memory of death, but of death itself. The Nazis took quite a few Jews and shot them to death right there in that cemetery. And to this day, you can see the bullet holes in some of the monuments that are left. As we kept walking in deeper, it was like we were getting new details as to just the history of this place and how just horrifying it was. And it was very sad to see what the Nazis did. So we know that at one point there was a grave there for my grandfather, but that grave is gone. It is a place where I know I have a lot of family buried, but I don't know where they are, including my grandfather, I've never been able to find his grave. Uh, after the war, many vandals came in, took away some of the tombstones, knocked them over, destroyed a lot of it. But then we found a beacon of hope. Our professor searched birth, death, and marriage records back to the 1800s, and she found one name. One grave for my entire family, more than 200 people. Only one grave. Through birth records, we confirmed my great-grandmother, my grandfather's mom. And that is the only family grave that exists for my entire family that I know where someone is buried that I was related to. Only one. And so we're going to go there now. Oh, my goodness. Wow. Hey, Aram. Yeah? I, I'm having problems finding it again. I'm not either. It was, it was freaky because we got there and Hagi was so sure where it was and we couldn't find it. Um, it was just like it was missing all of a sudden. We'll find it, but I thought it was on this row. And then finally we managed to find it. And the whole group gathered around and Hagi gave some words while Sean was wiping some of the dirt off the grave. Uh, this gravestone is broken. So this part that's on the ground was originally on top, and it's been toppled over. So at the very top, there's a candelabra for life, and it says, Isha's kena ve'yekara, 
Shiva Tamid Vyeshara, a good and dear wife who was always uh, straight shooting and honorable. honorable, always did the right thing. This is the place where my great grandmother lies. And it is the only place I have to mourn any of my entire history of my family. There's nowhere else, because most of them died in other places. Most of them died either in the ghetto, or in a concentration camp, or on a cattle car train, or who knows where. And those who came before them, their graves are gone. From the cemetery, we went to another place of death. This was the small ghetto, where the last surviving Jews lived before the Nazis sent everyone to concentration camps, including Moniak. Chinstahov, I believe, had somewhere in the neighborhood of 20,000 to 30,000 Jews at the beginning of the war. And uh, they moved them into to a ghetto, a large ghetto at first. And then as they were uh, you know, getting rid of people, shipping them elsewhere, uh, they consolidated to a smaller ghetto. The small ghetto was strange because as we were going through Chestahova, there's absolutely no indicator there now of where the borders to the small ghetto was. There's not very much left of it. It's kind of been built up around it and there's people that live close to there, but you can still recognize some of the older buildings based on old pictures if you look really hard. It was similar to Hasag in the way that here's this really interesting piece of history right next to normal life. Just that juxtaposition of hatred in the past to just normal life now was strange to me. In the general area where the small ghetto is today, I saw something that really disturbed me. Somebody had spray painted Ku Klux Klan on a wall, and I'm like, really, of all the, you know, all the things you could borrow from America, that's, that's the one you pick? And, you know, and it also showed me, uh, you know, that unfortunately that hatred is still alive in Chinstahova today. And so it's sad. It's sad to see it here, just like it's sad to see it in the United States, that some people would think different groups of people should have less rights. And we all just kind of took a moment and we just reminisced and we realized, like, this is why we're here, because that mindset still exists. We've seen a lot, haven't we? Oh, yeah. After another emotional day, we drove back to the hotel to reflect on what we saw. And it was just so tragic to see all of these, like, super, super old gravestones, and they're just scattered, and there's bullet holes through them. A lot of the uh, tombstones have been desecrated, either by the Nazis during the war or by other people afterwards. There's just no way to keep it at the pristine condition that it once was in, because there are um, almost no Jews left in Częstochowa. Just imagined what life could have been like had the Nazis not invaded. What a beautiful, beautiful town this is to have been visited upon such evil and hell. We made the drive to Krakow and then from Krakow, we went to Auschwitz. It was a fittingly gloomy day. The place that affected me the most was Auschwitz. I, I really still have not found a good way to describe it. And I can still feel it whenever I think about it. There's just this heavy weight in the air. I don't think any of us really anticipated how emotional it would be. Every step led to a new emotion. What I saw and experienced today there's like no words, really. Like, you really have to see it, unfortunately, to believe it. There's just this aura in the air that you feel when you're there. And you know that you're in a really solemn but really important place to be to understand what's happened in our history. Going in and like standing in the gas chambers and seeing where people were executed. That was all very horrific. And right next to that is basically a bunch of different ways 
for Jewish people to die. There was a firing wall for a firing squad. There were suffocation chambers where Nazis would just suffocate Jewish people. And I don't understand how people could do that to other people and just not think about it. And then just go and like, and sleep at night and then go home to their families and go about their normal day. Like they didn't just like destroy the lives of people like them. It was really hard to just face it, to face the evil that you know about. There were a lot of museums there that were very well put together, but also very hard to see. The exhibits broke down the number, six million Jews, to personal examples we could understand. Um, I think it was the first building you enter where it's the evidence of uh, systematic murder, and you enter the room full of hair, and I could barely take five steps in, and I completely, completely lost it. And it turned it into like a very personal thing that happened to multiple people. They just went to work like everyone else, and they went to school like everyone else, and like they had dinner like as a family. And they were just normal people, and the only difference is that they were Jewish. Every step that I took, I was stepping in this spot uh, where someone had died and had been murdered, gassed to death. Every step I took, because they were packed so tightly. Your body gets heavy, and it gets hard to move and hard to breathe. And you're just surrounded by the horror that took place there. Auschwitz was so planned, and I think that was the thing that hit me the most when I was there, is I realized that somebody had to plan the camp. I mean, someone had to really think about that in advance, and it wasn't just something that they put up overnight. I'm just so afraid that we're gonna forget about it. I don't, I don't want that to happen, and I don't want it to happen again. And I just like, I picture it happening to like people that I love. I don't know how humans can be so inhumane to other humans. Like we're all people. We're all the same because we're people. And for people who think that this is just history, like there was an attack today while we were at Auschwitz. It's our job to prevent it from ever happening again, to spread the message. I wish it never happened. I wish I wasn't here. I wish none of this had ever happened, but it did. And I'm here. I'm glad we can tell this story. And here we are approaching now. Uh, we will... With the weight of what we'd seen at Auschwitz, we left Poland for Germany to the concentration camp where Moniek ended up after the Nazis put him on a cattle car train here. So the train tracks are that way, and later on we will go. And they brought them in by the train tracks, which were over there and then they marched them on this, on the road, which we will see as well. He was locked in that cattle car for three days. The same amount of time we had visited all the places we had gone thus far. Let's not think about history, let's think about humanity and people who were stuck on a train for days, not knowing where they were going children who'd already lost their parents. Moniak was all by himself. Five years, right? Five years of horror. And he was about to enter what would be the worst. So then by this point, if you try to imagine how it was here for the first prisoners, you have to imagine a lot of chaos here along this street, a lot of violence. He was 14 when he arrived at Buchenwald. It was a horrible place. By the time he arrived, some people had died on the train. 
he walked off. There were German shepherds on both sides um, of the street with the SS guards, and so it was just a really violent, unpleasant experience for these men. And the idea also for the SS was to uh, humiliate these men. Once they marched through that iron metal gate, they could not ever go out. Walking up to these gates, these famous gates of Buchenwald, with a sign etched in metal that said, to each what he deserves. And my father remembers thinking, what had he done to deserve any of this? And just on the other side of the barbed wire, the Nazis built a zoo to entertain their families. This zoo um, had lots of different animals. This pit here, this uh, stone ruins, this was part of the bear habitat in the zoo. And the Nazi soldiers would take their families out to the zoo during the day, and just a couple feet away were the other prisoners. And these SS guards were told that they should spend their lunch breaks, for example, here in the zoo, because it would be a nice, relaxing way to have their lunch. And you'll also find in a lot of the SS family photo albums from the commander and the officers of the camp, photos of these men with their wives and children in the zoo, and then you'll see the camp in the background. I mean, they're literally within 10 feet, and I just don't understand how they could take their family there, knowing that 10 feet people are fighting for their lives and starving and being prisoners, and they're just over there having a good time visiting the zoo. The prisoners' humiliation began immediately. He walked through that iron gate and immediately was taken to a room where he was forced to strip. He was shaved. He lost everything that he had, the last of his belongings. He was taken to a barrack with wooden planks, four high, where people were forced to sleep together, some 500 people in one barrack. Diseases were rampant. People starved. I think today with Hagi and her brother and just being at Buchenwald, and everything like that, it, it impacted me more. We didn't exactly start at the beginning of Moniek's journey while on the trip, but we ended where he ended, and the, the prisoners were just treated like horribly, like inhumanely, and it was just disgusting. But today, that building where he was stripped of everything that he had, it's been redeemed of putting the art exhibition in a building that was used during the time of the camp as a place of um, humiliation was to try and restore the humanity uh, to these people through the art. They've turned it into like an art museum and they purposely make us walk through it the opposite way that the prisoners walked through to kind of have a symbolism for hope and that we can return the humanity to those who lost their humanity during the war. And I thought that was amazing. There was a display where it was a bunch of ceramic shoes where at first I thought they were real, they were very realistic, but they were actually all handmade. They each kind of had their own personality and they each represented like a different person that like perished in the Holocaust. So I thought that that was really beautiful. There was a statue that I, think about a lot. They were very frail and they were holding the Star of David and there was like a hole in the middle of their chest where their heart would be and I thought that that was like very moving. You could interpret it in different ways and I just thought it was like the most beautiful part of the museum. But the place that cut directly to our hearts. It just looks like a steel or aluminum plate on the ground. So what do you notice about it? Warm. What temperature do you think it is? 98 degrees. Exactly. It's constantly heated to body temperature. And this body temperature is supposed to be a representation of life and of something that essentially all people have in common. We're all human. We all bleed red. We're all at 98 degrees. And that's very powerful.
no matter what country we're from, no matter our religious beliefs, no matter whatever, we're all human and we all have that in common. And this is where, to me, the miracle of miracles happened. Two boys left from an entire family murdered. Two brothers who refused to give up. They were going to find each other if there was any possible way. And if they had not done that, I wouldn't be here to tell you this story. I leave you with this mission of making sure as many people as you can reach know that this really happened. This is the truth. Spread the word and spread that there is hope after hate. Hope after hate means that we don't have to be bystanders and just let evil happen. Uh, hope after hate means that we're all human and we're all connected. The more further removed we're from the Holocaust, the more people forget about it, and that's something that we should never forget. We need to acknowledge that this human atrocity happened, but there is hope to ensure that it doesn't happen again. It's, it's about forgiveness. I think, to me, all this pain that these people went through, they still came up out of it and created a, a new life for themselves. Bringing good people together, uniting people of all different backgrounds, ethnicities, and just fighting for what we believe in, fighting against hate, fighting against bigotry, and just loving everybody and accepting everybody for who they are. It's more than just a project. It's more than just a trip that we went on. It's more than a class. It's a chance to change the future and to remind people that we can't forget about our past because if we do, then history can just repeat itself. As long as you know there's just a shred of hope, you can grow off of that. It's definitely just the message out there that there's people doing this and that there's still people that care. It can be hard, but it's worth it. It's worth every bit. Hope After Hate is about fighting injustice in this world. We're all so different, but we're all the same. We can learn from all of these acts of hatred to switch them and turn them into hope for the future, that things will not repeat and that we do not forget what happened. Hope after hate, to me, is perhaps the only thing I can leave when I'm gone. Hope after hate is about today's young generation. This is the generation that will lead the future. And you, listening to this, it's in your power to make our world a better place. It's in your power to fight discrimination. It's in your power to unite us.